Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Your fellow workers, it may be hard to remember now, after all that has passed since then, but at this time last year, if you had polled both pundits and the political class and asked if Donald Trump was going to win the presidential election, probably 90% or so of them would have confidently said his opponents with a chuckle or a sneer and many of his supporters with a sigh, nope, never gonna happen. It happened. You may recall from your studies of history that one of the greatest miscalculations of the 20th century in his planning for the conquest of Europe, Adolf Hitler should have factored in the possibility of the United States joining the war against him. But he ruled it out, essentially saying, nope, never going to happen. It happened. Though we don't actually hear it spoken, never gonna happen is something we can easily imagine being said by the characters in the parable that is our gospel today and by the people it is spoken about in Matthew 21, 33 to 43. And in the same way as with our two examples, the people holding on to that idea end up discovering that their confidence was very much misplaced. With this parable, Jesus does a masterful job, of course, of drawing contrasts leading to conclusions. He shows us sense, nonsense, and God sense. It helps to start with some context. In Matthew, this parable follows directly after last week's parable of the two sons, which means Jesus is speaking on Tuesday of Holy Week in the temple courts in Jerusalem, and he is still responding to the chief priests, elders, and Pharisees who were challenging his authority and refusing to listen to God's call to repentance and faith. There would have been other people gathered around, Jesus and his disciples, of course, so the parable's message would still be recognized and resonate, even if it was rejected by the ones who most needed to understand and respond to it. As with many of Christ's parables, this one starts simply enough, describing a situation that would have easily been understood in their first century agricultural society. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. He leased it out to some tenant farmers and went away on a journey. Now you may recognize some of the imagery there from our reading today from Isaiah 5. It's likely that Jesus wanted that to register in his hearers' minds when, when they thought about this parable and what it meant. But even if not, it's a very sensible situation. A landowner wants the fruit of a vineyard, but since he can't tend and harvest the vineyard himself, he leases it out to people who can. And then, when the time approached to harvest the fruit, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. Again, this makes perfect sense. Since the owner can't be there himself, when the time comes to receive his share of the harvest as per the lease agreement, he sends his servants to collect it on his behalf. But then comes what happens so often in Christ's parables. Nonsense which shakes up his hearer and makes them say, wait, what? And pay close attention. The tenant farmers seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. What, 
What would make these men think that they could get away with this? We can understand greed making them not want to give the owner the fruit that was due him. Greed perhaps moving them to cheat the owner or lie about the harvest or or maybe just refuse to hand it over. But to beat his messengers, kill his servants, stone them? It does not make sense. Well, do they learn? Do they figure out that this is not probably in their best interests? Jesus continues, Then the landowner sent even more servants than the first time. The tenant farmers treated them the same way. Another way to interpret the original Greek here is that the landowner didn't just send more servants, but sent more important servants. But whether it was numbers or importance, it didn't matter. The tenants did the same things to them, the same things that they had done to the earlier servants. Beat, stone, kill. Shouldn't they have been afraid that the landowner would learn not only that his harvest was being withheld from him, but also that his tenants had had beaten and killed his servants to claim it, and that he would then come and settle accounts with them, taking what was his and exacting justice for the murders? What nonsense could they have been thinking? Well, some familiar nonsense. Landowner taking action against us? Nah, nope, never gonna happen. But here is where we see something even more amazing for its lack of sense. Finally, he, that is the landowner, sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. Again, this is not how the story was supposed to go. This is the point where the owner is supposed to show up with with the authorities or with his own band of violent men and get justice or revenge for his murdered men. But instead, inexplicably, inconceivably, he, he ups the ante. He puts the most important thing he has at risk in the hope that wicked men will wise up and do what was demanded of them. How did it work out? But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. They took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. More nonsense. Why on earth would the tenants think that murdering the son would in any way give them rights to his inheritance? And again, how could they not fear retribution from the owner when they murder his own beloved son? They must not have believed it would ever come back on them. Nope. Never going to happen. Now here is one of the interesting features of this parable. Instead of giving the interpretation or the, the moral himself, this time Jesus asks his hearers to give it. And it's possible he was actually asking the priests and the Pharisees to pass judgment on themselves, though it might not at first have been clear that that's what they were doing. So Jesus asks, So when the landowner comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? They told him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Then he will lease out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his fruit when it is due. Now that makes sense. No one could argue otherwise. That's what should happen in such a situation. Justice all around. 
The owner what gets what is due him from the lease, and the tenants get it what is due them for their wickedness. And someone else who will honor the owner and his obliga- their obligations will get possession of the vineyard. Now this would be just an interesting story if Jesus stopped there. But he didn't. He made the connection that condemned his opponents. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That is why I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces its fruit. The psalm that Jesus quoted, Psalm 118, which we sang earlier, was one that would have been very familiar to the crowd, especially familiar to the priests, and it would even be on everyone's minds because it was sung at Passover every year, and that was only days away. So this was not some obscure scriptural reference Jesus was drawing on. And what the quoted verses said was exactly what the parable had described. The rejection of what was most important by those who were responsible for recognizing and receiving it. So the landowner represents God the Father, and the vineyard is his people, Israel. The fruit, he expects, is faith in him, and the righteous obedience that the faithful gladly offer their Savior God. And the tenant farmers are the leaders that he has placed over his people to tend them and to help them produce such a fruitful faith. The servants the owner sends are the prophets, all the way up to John the Baptist, and of course his son is the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. The priests, elders, and Pharisees are guilty of behaving like the tenant farmers because they used their positions for selfish purposes, because they refused to offer God real faith, repentance, or true obedience, and because they did not return to him the fruit of people faithfully taught and led. And they behaved murderously in how they treated the prophets sent over the centuries and rejected their call to repentance. And what will be the consequence? In a way, the judgment proclaimed here might have sounded harsher to his opponents than telling them they were going to hell. What he said is that their favorite favorite position was going to be taken away from them and given to the Gentiles. The old covenant they counted on, even though they were not actually faithful to it, was going to be replaced by a new covenant of grace that offered them no privileges or position. They weren't going to be special anymore, but worse than that, there would be no place for them with God in heaven. And this they understood. A few verses later, we are told, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew that he was talking about them. Although they were looking for a way to arrest him, they were afraid of the crowds because the people regarded him as a prophet. But we said that this parable shows us sense, nonsense, and God sense. God's original covenant with Israel made sense. I will have you as my people and give you every possible advantage. And in return, you will give me the fruit of faith and obedience. But then we have the nonsense of the tenants, the leaders of the Jews, thinking that they can get away with abusing their privileges and rejecting God's messengers when they come to collect repentance and righteousness. And even the greater and the even greater and, and more amazing nonsense of the tenants thinking they can kill the son God sends, knowing full well who he is and 
thinking they can do it without consequence. Already at this time, the Gospels tell us, his enemies had started planning to kill him. There was no question that he did miracles. There was no question that he spoke the word of God. But he threatened their position. They did not want to listen, and so they plotted to kill him. Now, the end of the story gives us a return to sense. God passes judgment on the wicked among the Jews, on the arrogant, the unrepentant, the unbelieving, and now gives his promises and blessings to other people without regard to their heritage or ethnicity, to the Gentiles, people who will believe and serve him faithfully. But what is perhaps most amazing and what is most important here is the God sense at the climax of the parable. Something that does not make sense to human reason, but cannot be called nonsense. The Father sends His Son to sinners. Sends His Son, despite every indication from past experience, that they will not receive him with respect and honor, knowing full well what will happen at their hands. God does not treat sinners as they deserve, but in mercy gives them opportunity after opportunity, well beyond anything that is sensible or reasonable, chance after chance to turn from their wickedness and rebellion and put their trust in him. And this is just the way it was. Jesus, God's son, not only came to earth as his father's messenger, but continued on his way without hesitation, without turning aside, even knowing that it would end with his death on the cross. Knowing full well that these very people he was dealing with in the temple that Tuesday of Holy Week were plotting his death and would achieve it. Yet he was faithful to the end. It does not make sense why would the Father or the Son risk so much, give so much, do so much for wicked people who didn't appreciate any of it, who wanted nothing to do with righteousness and who had only been hostile to his servants in the past? Why? Because God sense is all about grace the undeserved love and favor of God for us undeserving sinners. That is what we are. That is what we started as. That is what we will always be. Undeserving sinners. Conceived and born in sin, well practiced in sin every day of our lives. But being sinners... That means that grace, grace is all that we have to hold on to, to gain forgiveness for our sins of, of arrogance, unbelief, and rebellion, our sins of wanting to keep our fruits to ourselves, our sins of refusing to listen to his word or his calls to repentance or to align our lives with his will. God sends gives salvation to those who could never earn it, who certainly don't deserve it. God, sense, gives eternal life to those who could never qualify for heaven on their own. And we gain all of this, all of these blessings, not through anything that we do, not through anything we offer the Lord, but through faith alone, by grace alone, trusting in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us alone. And how does it all end? 
Well, the parable tells us. The rest of Scripture tells us. It ends horribly for all those who refuse to repent. For all those who do not yield the fruit required of them. For all those who hear the threats of God's certain judgment on their, their, their sins and their unbelief. And then yet they still say, Nope, never going to happen. When the Lord's Lord returns to earth for judgment, it will happen. There will be no second chances because he had given them plenty already. If they then plead for mercy, we didn't mean it. We didn't know any better. Forgive us now and let us into heaven. His answer then will be, Nope, never going to happen. Said with tears, but true and certain. And they, the unrepentant, the unbelieving, will tragically spend eternity reaping the fruits of their unfaithfulness, damned to hell. That's the bad news. But that's not what God wants for anyone. That's why he sends his servants. That's why he sends his son. That's why he sends prophets and apostles and pastors and teachers and and parents who read Bible stories to their children and bring them to church and Sunday school. Because he wants us all to put our trust in Jesus Christ, to listen And respond to recognize that now is the day of salvation. And so for those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, the Son God sent to call us to himself, for them, for us, for you, there is forgiveness, salvation, and life, both now and forever. The faithful are given the vineyard of their Lord, And in that vineyard, we now have the opportunity to serve him and to bear the fruit of righteousness and obedience, to fulfill our callings as Christians, as witnesses to the gracious good news of full and free salvation in Christ, as husbands and wives, as citizens and friends, as employees and employers, as as teachers and students, whatever vocation God may have given us. It isn't nonsense, but it's more than good sense. It's God sense. It's grace. We respond to God's love and mercy, to his amazing grace in sending his son to suffer and die for us in our place to save us. We respond to that with repentance with faith, with thanks and praise, and we desire then, more than anything, to do all of that which is now possible for us to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been changed. We have been made new creations in Christ. We can do what we could not do before. Steadfastly bear the fruit of faith that he looks for from the vineyard of his church. This is the favorable time for that. We take nothing for granted. We will not receive God's grace in vain. God grant it to us all. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.